add me to the stream. Good afternoon, everybody. It is me again. Uh, hope we are live. Can you check we're live in the group before we left? Just so I can see. Um, yeah. uh, here we are again uh, on the subject of insurance. Um, this um, particular webinar is being carried in the Facebook group, but it's also in the uh, on our YouTube channel as well. So hello to you if you're watching it on YouTube. Um, as you know, uh, there's been um, some movement recently on uh, business interruption insurance uh, with the court, court ruling. Um, lots of other things have been happening. Um, uh, so uh, we've spoken to one of our gurus, uh, who I'll introduce straight away, um, Steve. Afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon. Being attacked by a fly, Steve. Hang on. <laughs> Just, just destroy my desk trying to kill this fly. Uh, how are you, Steve? You're right. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, and Steve um, is one of the people who helps us with with insurance um, in our little team. Um, and Steve's going to do a presentation for us on. Um, well, uh, Steve, do you want to explain just exactly what this court ruling is about and? Yes, so um, business interruption and specifically cover following an outbreak of a disease or pandemic and or closure by a public authority was subject to um, a court case recently brought by our regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority, against several insurers, although the, out, uh, the verdict is legally binding on all insurers. So it will just be a case of reviewing what the court ruling was and what that means for venues. Great, okay. Um, and then um, we've also got a couple of other people with us today um, because we wanted to open up this question, but there's a lot of questions obviously at the moment about insurance. Um, so uh, the first one I met, I'll introduce in order, was um, Charlie. Um, hi, Charlie, how are you? I'm going to have to um, feel good. Thanks, good afternoon. <laughs> Charlie, read that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, um, good and uh, Charlie, you and, you and me have been discussing. Um, well, really, we started discussing future insurance in the sector was where we started. Um, but then we got on discussing this particular case and um, the implications. Um, so Charlie's kind of here to talk about not just this, but also the future of insurance, I think, and also post-COVID and the current circumstances. And then uh, Charlie then introduced me to Stuart. Hi, Stuart. Hello, hello, hello. Um, and Stuart is also another um another insurance guru mm. uh expert uh probably knows what he's talking about much more than i do which isn't that hard when it comes to insurance to be fair um and so uh still i understand that you were actually sort of uh, you were involved in this case a little bit and you know quite a bit about it yeah i was um i i've i've been uh involved in it pretty much from the start uh, in various shapes or forms. I've been liaising with the FCA on it, uh, probably in a very similar way to Steam that I've been sitting pouring over judgments and transcripts and wondering what on earth that all means. Um, and uh, in fact, today I was listening. There's another hearing today, which is being live streamed. So just before this, I was on that listening to people analyze and dissect the meaning of what the word occurrence means, what the word event means. Um, so, yeah, so it's fairly safe to say that I now dream about it. Uh, so hopefully, I'll, hopefully I'll have something to say uh, of use uh, in compliment to, uh, to what Stephen's saying. Great. Okay. Well, look. Without without too much further ado, um, and and please, please, the three of you, I, I know that you love and live for insurance, and it's your whole life. Uh, but I take this in the uh, the intent in which I meant. I mean, it, this is quite can be quite a dry subject, but it is obviously very important this particular thing, the, the particular outcome, and then insurance in general for our sector is obviously really vitally important at the moment, and, and we so. Um, with apologies that this might be fairly dry, I'm going to put up Stephen's um, presentation, and uh, I'm not going to do a thing. Just looking at the slide, but I'm just going to actually drop us out. I'm going to feature that presentation, but we will all be able to be heard. So, darling Stuart, if you've got any comments to make about anything that Steve is uh, saying, then just just you know open up your mic and come in and speak. Um, you can use the mute mic like button function if you want to, but I'll put that full screen. Um, so, Stephen, without any um, further ado, do you want to just run us through what's happening? Okay, thanks very much, Mark. 
Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much outlined how we're going to play it. Um, we'll do a little bit of a recap as to what business interruption is, um, the impact of COVID, the court case and the results, and then later on get onto the insurance market and what it means for, for clients and for venues. Um, so just a quick introduction about me. Um, Sector Associates, independent broker based up in the north of England, up at Thirsk, although I... I've recently moved down to Ipswich, and um, that's my local on the bottom right, Steamboat Tavern, which is about 200 yards from where I live, and is a member of the Music Venue Trust. Um, so I always have a good catch up with Andy there about what's happening in the market, etc. Um, we do a lot of hospitality and leisure business. Um, we're members of UK Hospitality, so we work with Kate Nichols and her team, and also a licensee uh, association with Nick Griffin. Um, and probably same as Stuart and Charlie, we've been um, doing nothing but examining COVID-19 and wordings for about the last six months. Um, and there's been a lot of press coverage on it, um, some helpful, some maybe some not so helpful. Um, but we've been, um, we've been putting updates, and out, uh, updates to clients out on a fairly consistent basis. So just business interruption, just very quickly. Um, historically, it's been premises based. So a physical damage to a property, fire, flood, storm would be typical examples. And the policy would pay for your loss of revenue or income, loss of gross profit, or in some cases, increased costs that you've incurred to keep your business going. There are a number of extensions on business interruption section of the policy, and most of them have become industry standard uh, for what they call non-damage cover. And the two which we are really interested in today is denial of access, to the premises or closure by a public authority. And also you have something called a trends clause, which basically means in a very um, simple fashion is businesses don't usually have their income uh, the same consistent every month. They will go up and down depending on seasonality or, or other issues. And basically a trends clause will allow you to um, claim off your business interruption um, and it will take into account any trends that are apparent. So if December's a really busy month and you know, there's a fire in December, it will compare to what you did in the December's previous, and that's how you, you'll get your payment. And I'll go into why that's important. So I won't go over all the dates, but obviously 20th of March was, um, was significant and that the government directed various categories of businesses to close and then the 23rd of March was the announcing of the lockdown. So two main extensions to claim under your business interruption. One is disease, and the second is denial of access due to closure from a public authority. So insurance claims started coming in, and the insurance companies, by and large, declined. There was one or two that paid out, but mainly they declined the claims. And a lot of the insurance companies would say, look, why would we underwrite a pandemic risk? We don't have any data. We don't know how to price for it. It's not our intention to underwrite a pandemic. All of the diseases which we cover or aim to cover are things which are local to the premises. So an outbreak of norovirus, for example, at a location, not a global pandemic. Um, there was also the argument that there's got to be found at your premises or are they covering a local outbreak? How can a customer prove it? If there's been an outbreak locally and then there was the argument from the insurance companies that actually even if we were covering disease um we're not paying because it wasn't the disease that closed your business it was boris so we're not covering that and then the other argument that was kicked about by insurance companies was well you wouldn't have lost uh, you haven't got a claim because nobody was coming out anywhere so even if your venue wasn't closed down people weren't coming into the country People weren't going out because they were scared. And they used Sweden as an example, saying that there was no lockdown in Sweden, but people stopped going out. So you haven't lost any business because you wouldn't have had any customers. And obviously the FCA disagreed with this. So just, and I think this is important, this slide, because it just gives a little bit of clarity as to where the issues are. So a claim is submitted. If the policy specifies the, the disease, which it covers under business interruption. So if you close by anthrax, norovirus, flu, et cetera, et cetera. Then the insurance companies are saying it's quite clear the disease of COVID isn't on the list. And how could it be on the list? Because 
it didn't exist until now. So it's not on the list of specified diseases, not covered under the policy, and the FCA didn't have an issue with this. So that wasn't up for debate. Or you put the claim in and the policy says, well, we'll cover any notifiable disease. And COVID earlier this year became on the list of being notifiable. So that's the first hurdle. But it's got to be discovered on the premises. So we'll cover any notifiable disease on the premises. And that, again, isn't covered. And again, the FCA weren't concerned with this. So these things didn't feature in the court case. However, if the wording said any notifiable disease and it had within 25 miles or a mile or the vicinity of the premises, that's where the FCA said, right, we've got an issue with this. And I think um, there were a number of wordings. Hiscox is the one that's got all the headlines. I think Amling was another one. And there was one or two as RSA QBE. So it was this at the bottom which formed the basis of the court case. So I think just to be clear, because we've had a lot of clients since the ruling have rang up and said, I've seen the BBC News, we're covered, you know, we'll put a claim in. And when you go back to it, they're not. And I think when we looked at, I think there's 390,000 businesses potentially affected. But just to put it into, um, into some kind of context, that's about 6% of the businesses in the UK. So whilst it's great headlines that insurance companies have lost a case, um, in reality, there's a very small number of people which were affected. So the test case, the FCA brought the case, that's the Financial Conduct Authority, and they wanted to determine principles on coverage and causation. They looked at over 700 wordings from 60 different insurers, and eight insurance companies agreed to defend to participate as defendants. And there were also two action groups, the Hiscox Action Group, and the Hospitality Insurance Action Group, which I think they're called interveners, and they were also brought the case along with the FCA. Legally binding on all insurers, which is why we've all, I'm sure Stuart and Charlie have been watching this closely over the last few weeks. It was a two week trial at the High Court in July, again, live streamed. And yeah, 370 policy holders uh, potentially affected. So the court's conclusion on the disease issue, if the policy wording consisted of the following, so it said that it would cover the interruption or interference with the business, following a rising re result of any notifiable disease within 25 miles, a mile of the vicinity, then the insurance company was saying, this is a local occurrence, it's not a pandemic. The FCA disagreed. And the FCA um, won on that point, with the exception of QBE. So the QBE wording was slightly different and therefore would, cover wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be in place. But for the other insurers, if they had that wording, then the FCA won on that one and the insurance companies lost. And then we went to the prevention of access or public authority. And this, typically the wordings talk about prevention or denial or a hindrance of access to your premises due to the actions or advice by a government or the police or a local authority due to an emergency likely to endanger life. And the courts ruled that generally speaking, these wordings were more restricted than the disease wordings. So whilst the disease one's wider and obviously good news for clients, this one less so. But the, so the court sided with the insurers, but they said that each wording must be looked at. And it, it, so, again, that's where the likes of myself, Stuart and Charlie will come in. Um, so you really got to look at each individual wording on that. But you, it's really about proving that there was um, that the closure that you've had was specific to something that happened locally to you, as opposed to a wider pandemic. So kind of opposite to what you had on the disease side. So less, uh, less good news there for, for customers. The emergency or danger uh, in the vicinity so says that it's a localised occurrence of the disease and not the action taken in response to the pandemic. So, right, And then, and this is just to, to make it slightly more confusing, you could have two restaurants with the same policy wording, and if it was an eating-only um, 
uh, restaurant, then the prevention of access wording may well cover it. Or if it was eating and takeaway, they're saying that it was only partially impaired because you could still operate. So again, you'd need to look at the wording for each particular client. And then we had hybrid wordings. So this was a blend of the disease and the prevention of access. And the courts really took a similar view to what they did previously. The disease doesn't have to be local, but there's a much narrower interpretation of prevention of access. And then the court's conclusion on the trends issue. So there was a case for, uh, during Hurricane Katrina where the whole place was wiped out with the hurricane. There was a hotel in the middle of it. And the court ruled, or the insurance company argued, that, look, even if the hotel wasn't damaged, nobody would use it because everything was wiped out in the area. So nobody could get to the hotel. So therefore, you haven't lost anything and it's not covered. So the courts in the UK disagreed. They thought, well, they said two things. One, we're not bound by that ruling. And two, we think it's wrong anyway. And I would agree. Because I think that would be really harsh to say that but nobody was coming out because of the uh, because of the, the COVID, and therefore you actually haven't suffered anything. So what happens next? Um, well, at the time uh, there was a lot of talk about an appeal. Was potentially looking at one point two billion pounds worth of claims. Insurers are reviewing the judgment or have reviewed, and I think on the last day, which was earlier this week, the both both sides launched appeals. And I think it'll, it's called the leapfrog appeal, which means it will go back over the High Court and it will go straight to the Supreme Court. And we may be looking at early 2021. I haven't heard anything that maybe Charlie or Stuart have. Um, within seven days of the ruling, affected policyholders should have had a letter from the insurers, although all the letters that I saw basically said, yes, the ruling's been out, um, we're reviewing it, we'll be in touch. Um, I won't go too much through the insurance landscape because I think maybe Charlie and Stuart will add to that, talking about the hard market, the effect on capacity. So, in summary for me, um, it's generally positive news from the court case, but each case does need reviewing. Bit of a reality check, 6.2% of businesses in the UK might have cover. Um, we'll now await the insurance decision, possible appeal. Well, that actually, the, the will, there has been an appeal, so we're looking at early next year. And prepare for a hard market. And what that means by hard market, I think Charlie and Stuart will probably develop that a little bit more. So that's it from me. Mark, I think you're muted. I'm slightly confused by some of that, to be honest, and I'm sure many other people are as well, but well, it's pretty clear. Um, so actually, there's quite a lot of headlines about yeah. the insurers losing and how they're going to appeal, but in fact, they've actually lost on a, on like a very specific yeah. area of the, of the case. It, it, to me, like, actually, it's not... It is good news that we've got those very specific causes, but for example, you know, when it comes to the, the issue of being closed down by the, the government, that doesn't seem no. to be playing. And I think the way. FCA were quite clear after the review 700 wordings as to what the issues were and where it specifies the disease. That wasn't up to the day. That wasn't ambiguous. It was quite clear in the wording. The insurance company was clear what they were covering if it was going to be covering disease at the premises. Again, quite clear. And the bulk of the wordings I've seen, that's how they've been written. And they didn't even feature on the court case. So I think that's when you read the headlines, you think, wow, insurance companies have lost. There's not, there's 370,000 is a lot. I think for the hospitality and leisure sector, because there were a lot of people with Hiscox and maybe Amlin, one or two others, that's probably affected that sector more than others. Stuart? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, what, what's what's really interesting about some of the the ancillary news around this judgment is that, um, as you quite rightly pointed out, on the day that the judgment cop got passed down, the headlines on BBC News website and everywhere else were saying um, 
the insurance companies had taken a right pasting um, and it was and it was victory for the policyholders. Whereas in actual fact, on the same day, his Cox's share price jumped about 15% yeah. because they suddenly realized that actually, they, whilst they were possibly down on a lot of this, they weren't as badly affected as they had feared um, because of the modifications to some of those coverages. So in actual fact, you know, they always say, bookmakers never lose insurance companies very rarely lose as well unfortunately so um coming out of this particular scenario it is a very small amount of clients who are going to find themselves with the ability to make a claim now that ability to make a claim at the moment is is paused as well even if even if you're with his cox for example and it looked like you had effectively a an open goal we're still sort of at about half time really because as, as of today, there's a consequential hearing taking place where all the various barristers who were involved in the first case are submitting um, their, uh, well, their submissions to the High Court judges and saying to them, on some occasions, we think you've got it wrong. We think the judgment is incorrect. And if that's the case, they will then appeal uh, to take the case further to the Supreme Court. And as Stephen quite rightly said, that's looking at sort of early into 21 for us to get to that particular point, whereupon, whereupon that really will be the end of the road if the judgment is passed down in that regard. So at the moment, it, it's been very frustrating, I think, for, from all of us in the insurance industry, because there's this document in the High Court that is very authoritative, but it, it doesn't currently carry the force of law until we know what's happening with the appeals and the Supreme Court judgment and all of that. So we can interpret it, but I could interpret that this morning and find out that this afternoon, it actually, I need to bit put that in the bit because something else is now developing as part of the appeal. So so that, that's been a, a difficult situation for everybody in the insurance industry, certainly in the brokering industry. And Stephen, well, I'm sure will know this, is that you want to be able to say to your client, yep, we'll put in the claim in, you're entitled to this. At the moment, everybody's just unfortunately got to sit on their hands for the time being until such time as the legal process is worked out. So, um, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I mean, I, I want to really make sure everybody in, in, in our sector does understand. Uh, so let's just run over that point again. If your insurance policy specifically says, um, as, as a comment in the side window has come up, uh, an outbreak of any notifiable human infection or contagious disease back to the premises, and this judgment has no impact on your the words at the premises are definitely meaning that you're not included. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 my understanding of it. Yeah, that's quite, I, quite clear. I, I, I mean, I, I I absolutely agree with with what Stephen said there. The, the only the only caveat, and maybe this is me being overly optimistic, and I don't want to set hairs running here, is that certain of the wordings, for example, talk about um, they talk about the 25 mile radius. So an occurrence of the disease within a 25 mile radius is enough to trigger the policy. And the question has always been throughout the last six months whether you actually have to be able to say that the, the case within the 25 mile radius is the proximate cause of the downturn in the business or whether it's just sufficient for that to happen 24 miles away and you're locked down and the two of them are, are sort of vaguely connected and you can claim. The, the issue is, is that if you had somebody on the premises um, who had COVID-19 at some point, then is that enough for a causal connection between the COVID-19 situation and the lockdown? Um, in order to try and explain it better, it, it's basically to say that with some policies, certainly the QB1 and the, and the MS Amlin one, I think it was, they said that somebody had COVID-19 24 miles away from the premises. Um, that didn't immediately, I mean, that person was nothing to do with your business and nothing to do with the, the, the downturn in turnover or, or gross profit. But that person was part of a jigsaw of cases that gave rise to the national lockdown which in turn caused the closure of the business and the downturn and turnover. Theoretically, what's to say that somebody at your venue, restaurant, bar, club, who had COVID-19, could, who was on the premises at some point, could be argued as saying, well, they are also part of that same jigsaw, just because they're not within a 25-mile radius and they happen to be on your premises at some point. Is it possible to argue that they, in turn, have, have contributed 
to the to the national picture, which has led to a lockdown. Now that's a, that's a that's a a, a a niche argument, which I. I I haven't run yet for obvious reasons because we're waiting for the appeal side of things. But there is an element whereby part of me was whether if it's good enough that, is it good enough to argue on other cases? And I think only time will tell. Um, the bottom line, I think, is that we need to, to be realistic and say that it's more than likely that we won't be able to, to pin a direct incident of COVID-19 on the premises to the closure or the downturn and turnover. But you know, I, I remain yeah. ever the optimist. I'm always willing to have a go with these things. Again, from our sidebar, I mean, we've got a case here. We had staff at the time in March. We had symptoms and self-isolated. But back in March, there were no tests. So how can we prove that they have it? That's, yeah, that's the problem. That's a very good point. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and the fact is, is that if you didn't, I mean, COVID-19 was a pandemic. Uh, and without wishing to bore you with ancient Greek, pandemic means every person. So it's everywhere. So if it's a pandemic, then it's on your premises, it's not on your premises, it's everywhere. Um, equally, if the government hadn't locked the, the, the hospitality sector down, then invariably somebody would have gone on the premises who got COVID-19 at some point. Um, so the fact that they've locked it down meant you can't ever get somebody on the premises in order to trigger the policy conditions. Now, these are all very esoteric arguments that are sort of you know, floating around my head at the moment until we get a bit of clarity. But I absolutely agree with people when they say, well, you know, how are you going to know? How are you going to prove these things? Um, up until this point, it's been a question of saying, well, you need to be able to say this COVID-19 has directly caused this loss. Um, there's a certain modification in the entire court and will probably continue that we'll see a bit of clarification on, on how close that proximate cause needs to be. Okay, and and just on a timeline here, I mean, you say early 2021 for the appeal. I mean, are we, we're talking February, March, or I mean, we don't have a time yet. Or I don't. I do know the one it pushed through quick. That's the, all the, the stuff that I've read, but I haven't seen a definitive date yet. I don't know if you have, sure. And this, no, this no, I, I, I'm, with, I'm with him. Sorry, the, the leapfrogging means basically it's going to the the top court there is without any so this the final decision that comes early in 2021 will be the final decision there won't be any further deal yeah okay yeah, and, yeah. And, and 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 the other just the, the other point mark is the one thing that the court said that we're not getting involved with and the court isn't about is about quantum so you've got the first argument which is right okay we've got to appeal and it's covered now you've got the argument right how much have you actually lost and and, and then you, another discussion with the loss of business and the broker. That's the next. I don't mm -hmm. use the word. That's the next conversation. Okay, so that, I think that's what I was kind of trying to get to because I, you know we do have some members who think that they may potentially be impacted by this, and we have some who have certainly have some of in the facility or moral causes. We have some, some you know that plainly fit into that little category you had at the bottom there. But my question is. For them to plan, thinking about the process as a whole, if the appeal did go their way, if they were liable, they then enter a period of doing the quantum bit, of the assessment, the adjustment, and really when could they plan or when could they even imagine that cold hard cash might hit their account for their life? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the 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 one thing to say is that Hiscox, which is one of the very big insurance companies that's part of, they have already built a portal for the submission of claims. Uh, and I've seen it in its beta kind of uh, iteration. So assuming, or I say assuming, let, let's assume that Hiscox either don't appeal or don't, aren't successful in an appeal um, and then out, coming out of the Supreme Court, you would hope that they would open that portal broadly immediately um, people could submit their own claims or their brokers could submit their claims, uh, upload accounting information, get an offer and start getting cold hard cash quite quickly after that. And I certainly know that Hiscox don't want to delay that process any more than, um, than they have to effectively because they they've are. wasted yeah. enough time and money on this already. Once they know they're down on it, they want these cases off yeah. their books. Um, yeah. So so that could happen quite quickly. The other insurance companies 
hope, adopt a similar approach. But we're talking about insurance companies. They can be slow, lumbering beasts. Um, and some will be ahead of the curve and some won't be. So it, it, it may be a question of who George with. But at his side of things, I, I get the impression that if they are going to be down on it, they're going to start paying fairly quickly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, think that the, the, the sad thing is, is that the insurance companies may end up paying out, but a lot of businesses might have gone under by the time, yeah. you know, and if they had that cash seven months ago, six months ago, they might still be here. I think that, that's... Is, you know, is, there any, is there any recourse? To, is there anything anybody can do if that happens? Not, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I mean, Stephen's absolutely right, and and it, and it's it, it's scandalous that they have taken so long to reach this point and are still willing to to dither and, and appeal. Uh, part of our approach to Hiscock certainly it has been to say, look, you've had such a kicking for the last six months in terms of PR. Your, your share price has gone up um, after the judgment. Why delay this anymore? Why not just pay it and move on? Um, and you know, I, I think there is a certain justification for that. In terms of what people might be able to do post that, it's very difficult. The Enterprise Act says that insurance companies can be penalised if they take too long to reasonably consider and process a claim. However, if, if a case has had to go to the Supreme Court, clearly that has required a great deal of input and, and, and analysis on a very high level legal element so they would theoretically be able to argue well this was clearly a case that was incredibly complicated and needed to go to this point for us to get to that that juncture um it's normally on cases which are really straightforward but they spend six months waiting that you could probably lean on on that score so i think in terms of recourse it's probably going to be difficult um but you know, i wouldn't write anything off okay um sorry just posted up uh, and I guess this moves on, unless there's anything else you think we need to know. I mean, it feels to me like people should, even if they are impacted by this decision, realistically, they're looking at middle of next year before they finally receive the cash. Does that sound up too optimistic or too pessimistic or in the right ballpark? Uh, at a push next spring, at a push. Yeah. It, it, it's It's... Yeah, it's incredibly difficult. I think I think you're probably right. I think what next spring is is certainly one of the time scales. Equally, you know, you could get to a point that if only certain elements of the judgment are being appealed, that insurance companies might decide to make interim payments. So again, that's me being the optimist in, in this. But but there is a possibility that that could um, untie the post strings well in advance of that. So I think we'll know more actually. In the next week or 10 days so i would say to, to to your members that watch this space over this next week or so and we'll have a much bigger idea as to as to where we are then um and david um in, in birmingham has, has actually raised a really important point which i think has been covering the trend the their insurers have told them that even if they're required to pay out they will calculate downwards venue income saying that revenue would have decreased anyways and less people would have been going out to gigs so that's the trends issue that you were talking about. Yeah, I, I, they can't do that, in my opinion. That's what the court found. So that's mm -hmm. that's like the an argument. Well, nobody was going out, so you actually haven't lost anything. And no, that isn't that isn't. Okay. You don't think that'll stand up at all? That won't stand up, in my you know, okay. in my opinion. No, no. I I'd agree wholeheartedly. That that's one of the interesting things that's come out of the case is that the the court has absolutely kicked out that argument in terms of downward trends. Um, you may be aware that um, Barbican, Burns and Wilcox were one of the few insurance companies paying out before the the judgment, um, and they were paying out on the basis of that argument. They were saying, well, um, you even if you'd been open, everybody was staying at home and social distancing so that nobody would have turned up to your premises, so you wouldn't have had much of a, of a revenue anyway. Um, the, the the high court judgment says no nope, that doesn't apply if you're going to take out the, the closure you've got to take out COVID-19 as well um, and it's interesting that QIC who are the underwriters for Barkin and, and Bernal Cox have actually applied to join the allow um, having seen the judgment clearly they've thought well, heck we've decided to pay out we've accepted the claims and now this high court judgment is telling us we've got to pay out all this money which we never uh, thought we were going to have to do so they're yeah. now trying to back on on this ruling so um i absolutely agree with stephen basically i think it, it 
it's that's positive, isn't it? Yes, Joe, you got into our connection there, but as well, somebody's just said actually in the, in the chat window that it says, well, they don't think that business trend on and stand up judging by the amount of people who are now partying on the streets outside their venue. So uh, I think that's, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I think we would all agree with that. I mean, it's, it's you know, fairly lawless out there in various uh, cities anyway. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I think um, I'm just going to sort of... That seems fairly clear to me, a lot clearer than it did before, when it's been dirt and dry. I think I do understand where we're going with this. Um, a lot of other things have happened around insurance, and I'd like to kind of move on to that. Um, somebody actually has put up in, in the window again that our policy came up for renewal during the lockdown, and the only specifics that changed was the removal of all the business interruption calls of the old policy that we were denying claim against. <laughs> So um, that has happened. I, I'm, I'm aware of more than one venue that's happened to you. Um, I'm also aware of various kind of clauses being inserted that, that seem to be limiting cover in a much more accurate way. And in fact, I did see one person, I don't see the actual policy, but one person posted a clause saying specifically you're not covered for the event of the coronavirus. Is that generally happening or is that something specific that is happening case to case? What's actually happening out there with any kind of cover for anybody that might be open? Yeah, well, what we're seeing is that there's COVID exclusions on all policies now, on business interruption and public liability. Um, you can't exclude it under the employer's liability, and in fact, that's where I think insurance companies are worried where claims are going to come from. They still think there's going to be some COVID-related employer's liability claims coming in, um, as well as claims against directors and also cyber, which might come on to a bit later. Um, but yeah, COVID exclusions are typical now on, on all policies. And, and when you say COVID exclusions, that's an exclusion with, that's quite right, we're talking about both the staff and for so the staff will be covered under the employer's liability so there's no covered exclusion under el that i've seen um, but it's excluded for public liability so you can't have people making an allegation that they've caught covid and then suing the, the premises um and there's a, obviously a covered exclusion under the business interruption mm. and that a lot of that will be driven by the reinsurers that sit behind the insurance companies Okay, and, and, and my straight question here is, and probably not, this might be outside the field of experience, but does the liability still exist? You're not insured against somebody claiming against COVID, but if they prove that they caught COVID in your premises, it, does that actually mean they don't, it's not the same as they couldn't claim against you for the fact they caught COVID? Well, they've got a for liability, you've got to establish negligence. So did you have a duty of care? Yes. Have you been in breach of that duty? So you might have somebody that says, actually, I caught COVID at your venue. And the allegation is, is that you didn't do any of the checks. You didn't, you know, you were completely reckless. And I've therefore suffered a loss. I'm suing you and I'm putting mm. a claim against you. So well, I, and I think we'll see that. I think we'll see care home staff going after the, the, the orders. You know, we're already starting to see some claims coming in. Mm. I, I, I agree. I mean, d d obviously, this new normal, this new COVID world is one where people are going to be made redundant. People are going to be short of cash. And in those kind of situations, that increases this kind of hit and hope litigation that people bring against customers and what have you. So I think Stephen's absolutely right. I think disgruntled employees who get made redundant might suddenly remember a, a claim or they might say they got COVID on the premises equally there could be a group of people who are on the premises of a pub or somewhere who say that they're going to make uh, make a claim against somebody the issue is proving it but also the issue from the, from the clubs and pubs and restaurants and venues is having the documentation to prove that they've exhausted their duty of care so having a document that says yes we've addressed all this yes we've addressed the things that n are needed to keep people safe we've done all the sanitation we've got all the uh, social distancing measures in place so that if the worst comes to the worst and the claim does come in you can you have a documented regime that has addressed all of those things so it's all a question of assessing risk and documenting that you've done that to prove that you've done that and that will protect clubs as much as possible from nefarious claims just coming out of the woodwork for no apparent reason I, I, I do envisage solicitors popping up 
very similar to the old PPI. Mm. I think there'll be a, 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 a load of those coming in the next couple of years. Did you, did a member of the family call us? That's what happens. Mm. Yeah, I think the, the, the issue that points that is, um, especially in the current period of trading, where public cars and things are open, but trading under the circumstances where they virtually have to agree that range being with their local authority, then bear, I mean, this is not really an insurance issue, to be honest, this is a liability issue, but mainly their liability is heightened by a failure to carry out that kind of documentation of the measures they took that you just mentioned there, Stuart, that if you're planning on opening, it's very unlikely you're now going to be covered for a COVID outbreak, almost definitely not. And in fact, if you are proposing that you're going to do high sanitation, table service only, ticket, you know, all those kind of things, if you don't then do those, if you can't prove you did them and somebody comes back to you later, you are highly likely to be liable. Yeah. I, I, I think that's true. I mean, but at the same turn, you would say it should be quite difficult for somebody to prove that they got COVID-19 on any premises. Um, yeah. They could have got it at the corner shop around the corner on the way to work. They could have got it on the train, the bus, anywhere. So it would be extremely difficult for a claimant to prove that they'd got it. But I think you could imagine a scenario whereby eight or nine people who are unconnected with each other all get COVID-19 10 days after having attended one particular venue, then the, it starts to draw the likelihoods together a little bit. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's ugly, but I still think it's worth uh, venues protecting themselves. Okay. But they're not going to be able to insure against it. Is that the general opinion, Charlie? Are you seeing any policies where people can get covid um, yeah, so, so as, as sort of Stephen said, every insurer um, has added an exclusion under business interruption. Um, employers' liability, they, they, they can't exclude it. You know, there's the sort of laws protecting that. Um, and there are still one or two policies floating around that haven't sort of nipped it in the bud as much as they can, where there is still potential for public liability. Um, business interruption, I'd be very surprised if we um, could ever get yeah, anything claimed out of that. Um, I mean, we'll expect it in the next sort of, you know, 18 months, two years, um, some sort of government reinsurance um, for pandemics, if, if it is ever going to be included, because it is it is too big of a risk for the private insurance market to, um, you know, to include on, on their policies, because ultimately an insurer is just, you know, managing a fund everyone pays in, and then, you know, the insurers manage that fund and pay out when you have a claim for something like, you know, covid or, or pandemics in general it's it's just too too big for them you know to to, to include well that, that's actually also a question that's come up from in, in the side part how do we stand against future pandemics of a, a yet unknown virus pandemic and i think basically what you're saying there charlie is government itself are going to have to look at that because no insurance company is going to take the liability on yeah, so, so so what you tend to get for um for things like terrorism, um for certain high risk flood areas, um you, you tend to get, you know, the government will step in and they'll provide reinsurance, which insurers can then sort of reinsure themselves and then offer cover. Um in, until that happens, I I can't see any insurer sort of a, a, you know, providing any cover for, for a pandemic. It is it is just they, they can't rate it how much they're gonna charge, you know, it, it's too big for them. Well, I just the, the reinsurance thing is actually coming up on the top of the industry in any case with regards to the festivals and the larger events next year that they're basically trying to work out a deal with government where they may step into this market because they're being told, you know, your Glastonbury and your Reading festivals are finding it very, very difficult to get insurance for their events next year and it, it's it's a quite a big problem. Um, just with that, I mean, if, that, if you go, go back and start from the beginning again, you will see that question answered. Um, so, moving on to a post-COVID world, which I think we'd all like to do, frankly. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the things that we, well, there's a big learning thing going on for our sector here, I think, which we'll all, all open up to. A lot of the things that we've done in the past are, are practices that have developed because that was what was available to us. And, they frankly, that these kind of quite dry things that maybe drop down the ladder of importance. You know, what's important is trying to get a band on the Tuesday night. We've only got 20 people in there. La, 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 la. But I think a lot of people in our sector certainly are now feeling they may need to take a very big review of 
all kinds of aspects of their business. You know, who are they paying? What are they insured for? Is there a simple imagining that we, we do get out at some point in the foreseeable future? Um, you know, what what would you say about looking at insurance in that post COVID market? You mentioned a hard market. I'm not really sure what I understood that or what that meant, but you know, what what is it going to look like first of all, and what are the key things people should be doing? Yeah, so, so, um, so if I could just sort of jump in. So, so on the on the hard market, um, what ba basically what a hard market means is that there's um, more, more more demand for insurance than there actually is insurance. So Ireland has had a hard market for quite a few years now. Um, over in Ireland, there's a lot of venues are completely uninsurable. Um, you'll see small country pubs paying six, seven thousand, whereas over here, you know, you'd, you'd be below a thousand pounds sort of premium on those. Um, so there's a number of reasons for the hard market that we're sort of going into. Um, COVID is the sort of icing on the cake, as it were. W were it not for COVID, we, we still would have been going into a hard market. A um, couple of reasons, just sort of briefly without boring you too much. Um, the economy in general, um, traditionally, a lot of insurers will actually make a loss on the, on the book of business they're insuring. Um, so th they would be able to do that, whereby they're sort of managing this big pool of premium, they have that those funds and they'll make um, profits and, you know, they can invest those and, and get money back from those um, so they can afford to make a loss on, on the actual claims. Um, the way the economy is, interest rates are, are so low that they're not able to do that. So insurers are going to start sort of writing their policies for profit, whereas previously that wasn't, wasn't the case. Um, fairly significantly, you've got a bit of legislation called Solvency 2, um, which dictates how much capital an insurer has to have in reserves in order to write, you know, a, a particular piece of business. Um, so traditionally, they would have to have sort of twice as much capital in the bank compared with how much business they were writing. Um, EU legislation with Solvency 2 has pretty much quadrupled that. Um, so what we'll see in reaction to that is insurers either insuring less um, or raising more capital. And it seems to be that, you know, the, the simplest way to do that is just to insure less rather than trying to raise this capital so that they can sort of you know under regulations right right business um reinsurance as well in january we're expecting reinsurance costs to go up quite a lot um sort of globally you you, you have to remember that whilst you know a, a small sort of music venue in, in bury hasn't you know had any claims for the last couple of years but sort of internationally you know it, it's been fairly significant you know fires, earthquakes, you know, it's been a fairly turbulent um, couple of years. So those costs ultimately get passed down through the lines. Um, but leisure in particular, what a lot of insurers will do, they'll sort of reach deals with their reinsurers and say, well, OK, don't charge us too much. And instead, we'll, we'll stop writing these particularly high risk, you know, areas of business, which tends to be things like leisure, um, you know, some construction um, and whatnot. So there's COVID sort of adds to that. But but in either case, we are sort of going into a hard market and we do expect it to be much more difficult to get insurance um, and at a good price, you know, sort of in the future. Uh, do you want to want to put a, a number on that, Charlie? Or are you... <laughs> it's a, quite a quiet little group here. What, I mean, that's going to drive prices. That's, that's the bloody thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, insurance is going to go up. As I say, insurers will be writing for um, for profit now, and you know they're going to be a lot more stringent on what they will and and won't insure. So you know you can expect to see um, insurers coming back and saying, "Okay, we'll, we'll we'll give you a policy, but we want you to increase your CCTV up to sixty days. We want you to install this this you know high spec alarm, or you know so that there'll be a lot more requirements. And I think venues will have to virtually sort of work work with those to to be insured. Okay. I think also, I mean, and for <laughs> sorry, Mark, for, for clients, yeah, less demand from insurers to write risks, so increased premiums, increased excesses, more conditions, as Charlie said. But for the clients who maybe haven't looked at the insurance for three, four, five years, things like making sure that you turn over your, or your gross profit, your wage roll, if you've got the splits between your manual and non-manual, basic housekeeping that your broker or your insurance supplier should be doing, sit down and do it. Allow a bit more time for your insurance review this year in a hard market. Start a little bit earlier 
and get into the detail and be prepared to, to supply more detail. So you can manage those increases. The number of cases I look at where the sums insured are wrong, the profits are wrong, the turnover is wrong. And, you you know, so you can mitigate some of those increases by doing a thorough review. Okay. And again, people maybe haven't done it because the market's the market. I always pay for 3000 every year. Insurance guy pops along for half an hour. Great. Well, that's going to change. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's kind of what I was trying to sort of drive at. That you know, in, if we are into this hard market and if we are very aware the premium is going to go up, I, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Insurance is one of those things that you do tend to just go, you know, it, the, it's up. I need to renew it. So, yeah. so the process that we really need to encourage venues to be engaging with is much more engaged in this time. They actually need to be out there. Probably, probably engaging the process and, and getting something that's much more accurate for me is probably the first tip, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the, the, the key is, is, to, is to work with a broker that, that sort of knows the market as well. You know, you, you often see sort of people that have bought policies online, um, you know, they, they've got it for half the price of, of this, but, but when you actually look at it, it it's not covering what, you know, what it should. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all right saying, you know, well, we've got a £10,000 policy. It, it, it doesn't matter, you know, if, if it's not covering what it should then it's, it's a waste of money. You've got a £2,000 policy, it may be cheap, but if it's not doing what it should, then, you know, it, it's not worth the paper it's written on. So, you know, I, I think it's a case of sitting down with your broker, you know, sort of having a conversation with them about the business. Ultimately, your broker's the one that's in, approached the insurers on your behalf. Um, so, you know, you need to help them understand the business. Um, if you are a good business, sort of shout about it and, you know, and, and speak to your brokers about ways that you, you can bring your premiums down and, you know, present a good risk to insurers, which ultimately, you know, gets you better premiums. Okay. And, I mean, uh, uh, that was incredibly informative. I mean, basically, is there is there a specific process you would recommend? I mean, do they need to get more than one broker? What could they do? Form a relationship with a really good broker they trust? What would you guys recommend? Well, I think, okay. yeah, I, I would say, yeah, getting more than one broker involved can be tricky. And you think you're doing a good job by going to four or five brokers. The problem with that is, if you imagine that a hard market, premiums are going up, more people shop around. So your underwriter sat in Leeds City Centre, instead of getting 20 quotes in to do, you've got 40. Insurance companies aren't getting any more staff. So if they see the same case in from lots of different brokers, the likely it is the underwriter will just say, no, I'll move on to the next one. I've, I've only got time, so many hours in the day, I'll focus on the, the cases which I think I've got a chance of winning. So flooding the market by going to lots of brokers, I would advise against. But right. uh, speak to Charlie or Stuart, good guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think just, just to mirror that, I mean, you, you do see cases where, you know, you, you'll you'll have a you know a venue phone up and say can you get some quotes and when you do speak to insurers they've they've seen it you know from three or four of the brokers and, and as Stephen says they will just turn around and say you know we don't we don't want it you know we're, we're, it, it, it's not a case of you know being a comparison website so our advice is always you know I, I always encourage clients to get you know other quotes and say look you know have a look around and you know a, a good broker will actually be able to look at both of those policies and not just say oh it's 50 pounds cheaper sign here you know it, it's about having a broker that's going to be able to sit down give you sort of written comparisons and talk to you about what cover you're actually getting because you know as, as i say it's, there's no point in having a policy if it's not going to cover you you know if, if it's not doing what it should it's you, you're just throwing the money away um so you know speak to insurers but do, do your research and ask your brokers questions you know don't just sort of say how much is it say well, what am i getting what happens if this happens and you know if, if the broker sort of knows what they're doing they'll, they'll be able to answer those questions for you Okay, Charlie, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to sync your inbox with people saying, "Can you can you have a chat with you?" I mean, <laughs> um, uh, why? Well, I, I think this and that's been, that's been incredibly helpful. I think it's. I mean, I, I'm certainly a lot clearer on what this court case means, and also the the need that to actually get on top of this insurance thing. Um, thank you very much for your time, everybody. I am actually going to put some contact details for people up in the group underneath at the end. Um, so I'll do that on both the both the presentations here. Then we got anything else we they don't think we covered? No. 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 no.
And we've done it in six minutes less than we planned. How about that? Round of applause. <laughs> okay, well. look, um, uh, thanks very much for your time. Really, really appreciate all three of you. Really, really helpful insight there. And um, we'll keep following it and we'll come back if there's more information. Um, and certainly I know that people will be looking to find good broken stuff. So I'll put some people in touch. Great. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Uh, I hope that was helpful. And um, certainly I'm a lot clearer on um, what this um, court case actually means. So um, uh, please follow through on that. Um, it's going to stick in the groups. You can watch it again if you need to check anything. Um, if you've got any questions, please put them underneath this post and I'll follow that through. And I will pop up a couple of contact details for people so that you can follow up directly with them um, and get anything, um, anything else that you didn't get answered they can send directly through to them. Okay, so thanks very much. Love to see you all again. Speak to you soon.